All right, good afternoon. All right, it's awesome to see so many of you out here today. I know it's a, a busy day, but busy days are ripe for uh, important conversations, and I'm really excited to uh, welcome you to the latest installment of our Against All Odds speaker series. Uh, I've met most of you in the room, but maybe not all of you. Hopefully that'll be cured by the end of the afternoon, but I'm Daniel Pullen, and I have the opportunity to serve as the John V. Roach Dean here at the Neely School of Business. I'm also a professor of entrepreneurship and innovation, and this speaker series is another great example of the spirit of innovation that is alive and well each and every day here at the Neely School of Business. Uh, we're really running a business school in a way that most aren't. We're operating at the intersection of the academy and industry. Increasingly, we're bringing in real-world stories, real-world uh, learnings from our corporate partners, from our alumni, from our friends of the university. And to have a speaker series dedicated to the topic of inclusive excellence is very much in step with our strategic plan, and how we're modeling the business school of the future for the rest of the 21st century. Uh, we just got out of a great uh, meeting at the Neely Board of Advisors today. We were walking through our progress on our five-year strategic plan, we were in year number two, um, and at the heart of that plan is inclusive excellence, a commitment to a talent management strategy that is designed to attract and retain and propel a diversity of people and a diversity of ideas. And I think we're going to see both on display here this afternoon. So I'm going to get out of the way and turn it over to our fearless leader of Neely's Office of Inclusive Excellence. It's only the second such office in the Big 12. It's one of only 20 in the entire nation. So this is a point of differentiation for uh, what happens substantively sub here every day as well as how our brand is being framed and recognized nationally. Ann Tasby is the director of that office. She's also an amazing accounting professor who operates at the individual student level. I wish all of you could take one of her classes someday, and maybe some of you will. Without further ado, Ann Tasby. Thank you, Dean Pullen. Of course, he would be embarrassed if he knew I was going to say this, but Dean Pullen has been an amazing supporter and leader, and that's the reason we've been able to make such strides in our efforts on inclusive excellence. So again, thank you, Dean Pullen. And so I tell you, I, I'm, I just want to give you a bit of perspective about how this whole series came to fruition. Um, it, is the, it was the brain trust or the, the, the vision of, of uh, David Russell one of our Neely Board of Advisor members, as well as, as well as I, we collaborated on the conceptualization of the series and we thought, hmm, what would it be like if we brought real world, real world business leaders to talk to our students about grit and determination? And so we're excited today to bring you our third installment and, and, we have brought to the table some amazing legends from TCU, keeping in line with our 150th anniversary. And so without further ado, I want to introduce you to our uh, moderators and our speaker. Um, we have uh, Charlie Davis is our featured uh, speaker today. Charlie is, um, he is a, he's the first black, um, he's the first black graduate, I'm sorry, um, student athlete graduate of the Neely School of Business. And he's going to be interviewed today by two of our amazing trustees. We have Ron Parker and Kenny Thompson Jr., who you might recognize from our first installment of the series. So with that, guys, they told me don't, they told me don't say too much. So they're going to get into it. Come on out. Thank you, Ann. And uh, let me say thank you, Dean, um, for being uh, open and flexible to um, a conversation that uh, we promised Ann that we would keep her job by, um, by being civil. Uh, but when you get three former athletes together who, uh, who's looking up in the stands as some former teammates, John Ott and others, uh, Horatio Porter, who's also part of that, uh, that club uh, where there he is, the mayor, I like to refer to him as, uh, you, 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 this conversation may go in many different directions. <laughs> just, just, I'm old enough to say what I want to say and not apologize for it. <laughs> but I am not. Said, <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just forewarning you, Dean. Please keep her. You need her. She's great, but uh, she is not responsible for what we're about to say <laughs> and what we're about to share because we are to enlighten you, um, to share with you. Um, some of the untold stories that's a part of the Neely School, that's a part of TCU, that's a part of our 
our makeup as an organization, as a state that you may not be aware of. And uh, I'm a big believer, I know Kenny and Charlie as well, that uh, people have, we all have stories. And the essence of really getting to know people in an authentic way is to hear their stories and appreciate, not judge, but appreciate their stories in ways that it adds to your understanding of the fact that uh, we have encountered a number of things in life that uh, has gotten us where we are today. So uh, with that, uh, I'm going to ask uh, our featured guest here. Uh, well, first of all, I'm going to ask Charlie, uh, 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 Kenny, if he would like to say a few words. And then let's toss it to, uh, to our featured guest here, Charlie Davis, uh, whom I've known for probably, what, uh, maybe 40 years, uh, who was my roommate when, uh, when I uh, was drafted by the Bears and we trained together that summer. Uh, I have stories about training <laughs> together that summer and living in an apartment together that summer. Uh, but uh, he and I were chatting, and to Ann's point, he, to our knowledge, uh, is the first black student athlete to graduate from the Neely School. And since we are in the Neely School, I think that's a very wonderful footnote to, uh, to reflect in our 150th year as we approach it in 2023. So, Kenny, some opening words, and then we'll, uh, we'll get into our conversation. Sure. Thank you so much. It's good to be back. I like to say it's good to be back home. Um, I won't confess, I am not a Neely School graduate but I did walk by this building a lot. Uh, and I feel like I learned a lot by osmosis back, uh, back in the day. Um, it's truly an honor for me to be sitting up here with these legends, right? Like, um, I am slightly younger than they are. So when I was here at TCU, um, I may not have had those opportunities because they laid the groundwork for me. Like, I'm fully cognizant of my experience was solely based on their experience, right? So for me, it is quite an honor to be sitting up here with true TCU legends. I hope to be a TCU legend uh, in the future. So it's um, truly humbling for me to be up here with you two today. Um, Charlie, I know, I know a little bit about your story, um, but just give us a little bit of background on your experience here at TCU, your time, um, you know, just a little bit of background for the folks uh, who may not know exactly how big of a legend you are. <laughs> <laughs> That's a real setup. <laughs> First of all, I'd like to say thanks for having me, and uh, I really appreciate being able to come back home here to TCU. Um, one of the things I said to Miss, I mean Professor Tasby, was that they don't have grass here anymore. I mean, they grow <laughs> buildings. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> that's a compliment to all the alumni and uh, donations and things that have happened before and since I was here. Um, TCU is a very unique place. Uh, before I get into the story about TCU, let me back up a little bit and, and set the stage. I grew up about 120 miles south of here in a little town called Wortham. It had a population of about 1,000, 1,080 at the time. And I walked on for football my sophomore year with four games left in the season. And if you played 16 quarters, you would letter. And I was held out the f uh, first quarter of a homecoming game, which I only got the 15 quarters. That was an opportunity to walk away and say, screw this. And it just made me more determined. And that has kind of run through me from the beginning all the way till now, because the obstacles and things that I ran into, they're unbelievable. They're unbelievable. Um, we're talking 1970 when I came here, and it was different. Not only was uh, I the first black graduate from Neely, but the class that I came in with John Ott and the guys, I was the first black athlete that freshman year, the only one that signed. And uh, I didn't even realize that because I was so focused that somebody asked me two weeks into the training camp, how many black guys are on the team? And I started to try to count. <laughs> and, and I just turned around and I realized they treat us all like dogs. It don't matter what color you are. <laughs> <clears throat> you know, so uh, it was an experience, uh, but I fell in love with the place. It's convenient to home. Um, the people were nice. 
Maybe they were kind of afraid a little bit. We were checking each other out. But everybody on the team got along really, really well. Um, the story is behind stories, but as far as my experience coming here, right off the bat, it worked out well. It worked out really well. Now, Charlie, you were here um, at a time where there was a group of athletes who, black athletes, mm -hmm. who, uh, who made a decision to leave. Exactly. That created a lot of controversy on campus, uh, in the media, and uh, around the state. Uh, give us a sense as to why you stayed versus leaving with those athletes. And name a few of them because they're very prominent athletes that you guys would know. But give us a sense of who those, who those individuals were and where did they go. And, but what was the, 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 the stickiness that kept you here and being a frog? Well, um, I think that was my soft, going into my sophomore year. Uh, there were some things going on on campus with the student body, black student body, and they started to talk about social life on campus. Now, when I came here, and, and the reason I stayed is because I had set goals, and I didn't want to stay for four years. I wanted to graduate with my class. I wanted to make All-America, and I'm out of here. And so all that happened for me. But for Larry Dibbles, for Hodges Mitchell, for Danny Joe Colbert, for Avery Garnett, Ray, Ray Rhodes, they got caught up in the no social life at TCU for black athletes. And it's funny, I'm from a town with a thousand people, and social life is it's like, <laughs> that's like working together. You know, <laughs> that's what it meant to me. We, we worked together. So uh, they went on to different schools, Mexico, Tulsa. Uh, some of them went on and played pro ball. But it was a real disruption because TCU was at a point, I think, before any other school in the conference, which was Southwest Conference, to distinguish itself and be a prominent school for uh, sports, for minority athletes, a uh, place to excel. The curriculum was great. Um, professors were fair to a point. I had one that was off the chain. <clears throat> Actually told me I wasn't gonna pass my final, so he wouldn't give it to me late. <laughs> but it's, um, that experience, had me to go do some really deep thinking about why I was here and what I had planned to do. And my focus on graduating was because of my parents, because I was the first one to go to college on a scholarship. Um, it was my commitment to doing my goals. The things that I set out to do, I wanted to do I didn't come here for a social life or anything. It wasn't on my list as a high priority. It certainly wasn't worth me leaving school and getting another year or finding another college or whatever. And um, I stayed, made to all Southwest Conference teams a couple more years, made to all America teams, graduated with my class. And uh, there's guys like John out up here and all that. We went through a lot of stuff. And I don't like to get into it, but it was a lot of stuff. So, uh, Kenny, you had a similar situation. Being a baseball player here, uh, and that same question, how many other black baseball players were there on the team? I mean, what was it like for you to come through and be a trailblazer in a sport that was highly profiled um, at the same time uh, with uh, probably some personal directions from your family members about uh, persevering against all odds. Yeah, I mean, I think back, um, I came from a very like diverse high school, right? So it was like everyone was mixed up with everybody. And when I came here, it was a lot different than it is now. Um, and I had grown up playing baseball with black kids, white kids, Hispanic kids. But you know, that, those first two years here at TCU, it was just me. 
And that was why that was weird. Like it was just like a completely different. Not only was the school different, like what I was like used used to, but the sport I loved, the whole fabric was very different. So, um, I really focused on the game. I really focused on being a better baseball player, and becoming a really good student. Um, I focused to to a certain extent, probably too much internally, right? Like I just sort of. L- turned inward in a way that looking back may not have been the best approach, but that's how I reacted. I sort of kind of became not myself for a little while. It's one of the things I always talk about when I come here. It's just, it was, wasn't was easy all the time. And I sort of became not myself for a certain while, sort of a point of, sort of a certain amount of time. Um, but eventually someone else on the team looked like me. <laughs> and we had like, you know, you, you, just like everything else here at TCU, it's, it evolves, it's a process. And, you know, we had like three or four. Um, then we started, you know, um, the football team and, and across the, the athletic uh, facilities. Um, it started to become a little bit more um, a place where I could be- become my, my true self, right? Like sort of just be me. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, those first couple years, man, I was like, I'm not sure about this whole TCU place. Um, I honestly was as much as I love it now, I can't believe that I would, was potentially on the verge of leaving, right? Thinking back to those times, but my parents, God love them. They're like, no dude, you're staying, you know what? You're locked in. We made a decision. You're going to get through this. It's supposed to be hard. If it's, if it's, if it's easy, it's probably not worth it. So, you know, we're going to stick to it. And here we are, you know, um, 20 years later, sitting here up here with you guys on the board of trustees of this school. You know, so, I mean, I think for me, those first two years were definitely difficult, but um, perseverance, you know, it's the key. Well, for me personally, I transferred in my sophomore year from uh, Blinn College. Uh, Back in the day, uh, John would know this, Charlie would know this, for freshmen, you could not play on the varsity. You were basically a, a uh, on the scout team, uh, and we used to say, "What blocking? You were a blocking dummy. You were supposed to sit there, keep your mouth shut. If the other uh, teams in the conference had a freshman team, you may have six or seven games maybe to compete. But in essence, you are almost like redshirted uh, your freshman year, so you couldn't start. So, uh, you know, coming out of Brenham, Texas, uh, home of Bluebell ice cream and contented cows." You know, I basically made the decision, you know, as a tight end, I was not going to be uh, in a four-point stance. And so I spent my time, uh, my first two years at Blinn College, we run the national championship my freshman year, we went six and four my sophomore year, and I had committed to TCU, but I said, I'm going to go this route because I wanted to play. I didn't want to stand around holding up a dummy for people like John Art to come and block me and I don't get to play on Saturday. So I said, wait, I'm going a different route. Uh, so two years of experience, and then coming here when Jim Schaffner was named the head coach with a new coaching team, I felt, ah, now everybody's on the same footing. There is no first team, second team. We all are in this together. And uh, met this guy named Charlie Davis, who was drafted by the, uh, Steelers. the Steelers, and he came back that spring, and, and I remember him working out on the field. And, John, I don't know if you remember this. This guy at you no know, six foot two, uh, over 300 pounds, actually did a complete squat on the field with one leg going north, the other leg going south, and his degree of flexibility, where I could barely touch my toes. I'm saying, how does one do that? And that's when he shared with us that the league was a whole different stage. It was a different level, and one had to commit to it. But Charlie also explained to us what he had to endure that allowed him to be in that position, to be on the, what, the first Super Bowl team Steelers of the Steelers. First. Steelers first. Steelers first. Uh, later got tr- uh, uh, traded uh, to the uh, St. Louis Cardinals. Uh, but um, you were also in the school of business. Yes. And tell us about the story of the professor who basically told you <laughs> that there was no room in the business school for him and what you did to ensure that there was room. Well, what happened, uh, it was my senior year, and we needed six hours for that last semester. 
to graduate. And one was social environmental business and another was like a finance selective elective. And I was already taking the finance class in the fall. So I had got selected to go play for the Blue Gray game and down in Alabama. The game was on the 9th. The semester didn't end until the 18th. And I asked him about taking the exam on what we've already covered so, so I could finish up. And uh, he said he didn't want to change his syllabus. No, he wasn't going to allow me to take the test. And then he said, you're not going to pass it anyway. And uh, being me and being creative and having to come up with solutions just to get that far, I immediately left his office, went to the register's office, took an incomplete in the course, signed up for a Wednesday night real estate class, put my name on the list so whenever it opened up, I would have it. Went on and enjoyed the bowl games, played in three of them. And on January 18th, when school started back, I was able to have Tuesday, Thursday classes and a Wednesday night. Four-day weekends, it was great. <laughs> so, <laughs> but so that was one of the situations that uh, just kind of stuck out in my mind. It's like, you don't have to be mean about it. You don't have to, you know, try to be understanding, you know, just say you're not going to graduate, you're not going to pass them anyway. And to be able to stand up and graduate with my class is one of my most proudest moments um, of the struggle here at TCU. And I say struggle simply because there's so many things you keep inside. You just persevere, you push, you push, you push, you drive, and you're committed to what you're doing, you're focused. And sometimes it's hard to even have a conversation because you're so focused that your listening is not working. And getting into a class and being in that class, sometimes it's hard to be there because you're just having to Tame, tamp things down where you can kind of like, okay, I'm in this classroom, let me be here. And so uh, it, it was tough. It was tough. But tell us about the chair. Come on. Yeah, <laughs> okay, freshman go year. Go, yeah, go, go there where the chair, the when chair I, story. <laughs> when I first came, uh, I went through registration and some of the classes were closed and you weren't able to get, they said, well, these athletes are taking these professors here. And I said, no, I have a time that I want to take this particular class and this particular class. Well, if you want a good professor, I said, well, what do you mean a good professor? Well, he, they're good for athletes. I said, no, no, I just want a professor that at this time. Well, that class is full. I said, what do you mean it's full? Well, you know, it's full. Well, what determines whether it's full or not? When they let me know is the number of chairs in the room. <clears throat> so I had to go ahead and just sign me up in case somebody dropped out. But what I really did, I signed up for it, and I went and found the room that that class was going to be at, and I drug another chair in there. <laughs> so that's the story on the, <laughs> on the chair. <laughs> yeah. So, Dean, so. That's, that's what we call being creative, uh, being innovative, and being resourceful, all right? So and those determined. Are, those are the leadership uh, attributes <laughs> that I know you, you teach in the business school. Kenny, what about you? I mean, baseball, you and I met, uh, and there's a story behind every story. I got, I'm old, so I got plenty of stories. But I'm in the White House uh, for a holiday, holiday tour, just being amazed by all of the different holiday decoration in all of the many rooms. And the way I met Kenny Thompson was he tapped me on my shoulder and he, and I turned around. I was admiring this beautiful tree that was from some state out, uh, out west with all these beautiful ornaments. And he first, he didn't introduce himself. He asked me my name. He said, are you Ron Parker? So I turned around and I said, damn, CIA? <laughs> I, I, I don't recall taking anything off the tree. I didn't put anything in my pockets. And he introduced himself, uh, but when he said, I'm a TCU frog, that started the relationship. But tell us a little bit about that journey from being a baseball player, graduating, and where you ended up, and 
share with them uh, basically that situation that you and I first met uh, several years ago? Yeah, I think, um, first off, I feel like I'm in the audience, which is awesome. I'm just like listening to these stories, um, just reflecting on so much that has happened to this university in the past. Um, but yeah, you know, frogs seek out frogs. Like once you guys are done here, you're, not, you're never gonna be rid of this place, which is a good thing. Um, I knew Ron, of Ron Parker. Um, he's obviously a TCU legend. So when he, I saw the, the guest list, and I saw Ron Parker's name on it, like, all right, I'm going to go find this guy and introduce myself. Um, because, you know, whenever I see a frog or come across a frog, I want to meet, I want to meet them. Um, so met him that day. I think we probably talked once a week since then. That was back in 2012, 13. Um, he is a legend at PepsiCo as well, is where I currently work. So I thought to myself, all right, we got a, a black student athlete who went to TCU, who also worked at PepsiCo, like this guy needs to be, be in my life for, for, for right? <laughs> um, but yeah, you know, I think the thing, the characteristics about being a student athlete, particularly a baseball player in my case, is the team, the team concept, right? Like I'm a big believer in, in team and working together, finding those common goals and moving in the same direction. And I've, those attributes that I've learned as a student athlete, those friends that I've made here at this university have literally helped me every step of the way in the private sector, in the public sector. At the, the core of everything I try to do, it's about service. I used to think that the only way to serve was being in government or a nonprofit, those are great. But when I moved over to the private sector, it was a completely different set of opportunity to serve. And I noticed that the, the opportunity to serve is up to you, right? Like it's not up to the industry you're in or the job you're in, it's up to the person and what they want, what they want to do and how they want to serve people. Um, so I try to take that element of service to the private sector. And I credit this university for that, um, I credit the people that I met here, uh, the experiences that I had here. Um, because, you know, I, I always say that TCU is the foundation of everything I've ever done. I, my parents don't like when I say that, but like, uh, <laughs> but, they're the, but they're the reason that I came to TCU. So, um, you know, I, I, I always try to ground everything in public service. Um, and, I, and I got that sense of service from my time here at TCU. So Charlie, you know, Super Bowl uh, recipient, uh, player, um, uh, but being a business Neely School graduate, kind of talk about talk about how did you use that your athletic experience and success, and and how it translated into business relationships, building up off of the Neely Foundation that you got here as a student. Well, early on, um, right after Super Bowl, I came back to TCU and uh, took an education curriculum to get uh, secondary ed certified lifetime to teach high school. And uh, I find myself in and out of the high schools uh, working with the kids all the time. We got a program to work with the kids and the police to, uh, and we started this in 2000, to create a better relationship with the, we figured if they knew each other, they wouldn't have to be intimidated by a police car driving down the street and the police wouldn't have to go, who are you and what are you doing over here and this and that. So we were trying to create relationships and that company was Faces. We had the software to help solve crimes and different things like that. And we did it for probably 15 years. Um, then I moved on to uh, the financial services and things like that, insurance. Um, went into banking. My interest now, as far as banking goes, is how to get people out of debt to pay less interest on whatever their mortgages and bills are just to get them out of debt. So uh, you can do that. If I said you can pay your mortgage in a half or a third of the time with the same money, that would interest most people. And so uh, we're promoting a program like that. Um, so it was marketing and banking. Uh, we did some coaching, uh, student coaching. I came back to the school and worked with the staff here at TCU for 
a couple of semesters. Um, the things I've learned at Neely is a surprise to most people I meet. <laughs> it's like, how do you know that? Or where did you learn that? And sometimes I feel underutilized because I have to like prove that I know it. They're not just accepting it as a fact. And I'm, they, I mean, the marketplace or the business or whatever. Um, we had such uh, impact as a freshman coming here on the football team, on the campus. It was so positive. And even though it was tension from time to time, but we got, or at least I'll say, I got what I came here to get. And that was to graduate, get the degree, and make all conference all America and, and get a good job, which turned out to be NFL football after that. Um, so I feel that I have the capacity, even today, to get involved in the marketing and selling and advancing of supply chain or whatever it might be. So um, it's still functional for me for as Neely goes. Well, for me personally, it was you know, being from Brenham, not that much larger than, well, yes, it is considerably larger than, than Wortham. Uh, it was, we had at least, at least 15,000 people. You guys only had 1,000. We had two uh, caution lights. Yeah. Um, but I would tell you, my, my experience here, and I say this quite often when I'm asked, I used TCU and the Neely School because it was the first governance experience that I encountered uh, by being on the board of uh, advisors for the Neely School. Uh, I was asked to be on the board by John Roach, uh, who is the uh, founder, uh, was the chair of our board, but also uh, the founder of the uh, Honors College here. Uh, Ed Schulmeyer, uh, whom I think we all know, um, who basically allowed me uh, as a PepsiCo executive to find my place and my voice and to rediscover me by being connected to TCU. Um, because the moment I entered that particular Neely Board of Ed Visitors, I, very much like you, Charlie and Kenny, I was immediately accepted uh, with some of my crazy ideas that I have that I offer up for the dean uh, to consider and the staff to consider. Uh, it was my way of giving back and leveraging that experience. But let's fast forward here. This is where we're going to put Anne on the edge of um, her being comfortable with what we're going to say here. Um, fast forward to today as former athletes. Um, Kenny, how would you describe the environment by which an athlete must be able to uh, demonstrate that true grit and that determination that both you and Charlie have expressed with all the things that are around them? How would you basically differentiate between your time here and what they are experiencing now, especially with social media? We'll start yeah, look, I... So grateful. I just missed the social media era. Like, I just missed it. I think, like, Facebook was, like, just starting when I was uh, here. Um, I can't imagine the uh, amount of pressure, the amount of constant um, attention that uh, student athletes and students in general are under, right? Like, they're seeing what their peers are doing on a constant basis, right? Like, you, I struggle with this as an adult on Instagram and on all that other stuff, like, you're just always, how do you avoid comparing yourself to what other people are doing if you are <laughs> constantly seeing what they're doing, right? Like, um, that element is something that I cannot imagine uh, going through on a, a regular basis. The voices now that student athletes have, students in general have, is to voice their opinions fearlessly wherever they want. Um, whether, you could be Snapchatting right now, um, and the world is going to see it. And it doesn't go away, right? Like, it's out there for the world to see. And 
the, the amount of influence that um, student athletes have now with NIL, um, that they can make money for their image and likeness, you know, the pressure that they have to do that. Do they have the right knowledge to make sure that they're doing things appropriately, to make sure that they are leveraging themselves in the appropriate way, that they're not being used, right? Like, these are all things that I didn't have to deal with. I don't know if I would have had any denial deals, but, like, even if I, you know, but, um, you know, those are, those are issues that, uh, that we're still dealing with, right? And one of the things that I think this school in particular is ahead of the curve on is bringing student athletes in to teach these steps and these processes for protection for these athletes. Because not everyone has their best interest at heart. There are some nefarious people out there who will take advantage of student athletes, students in general. Um, so to have a, a school that is intentional about protecting our athletes, protecting our students in this case, uh, is crucial and critical because a misstep here could hurt you financially for a long time. Um, but taking the right steps can set you up financially for a long time too. So um, I think it's, it's critical for our athletes across the board um, to take advantage of these opportunities, to take advantage of a school that says, hey, come on, come in there. We're gonna like walk you through this process. We're gonna introduce you to the people who we trust, who know have your best interest at heart. Because that's, it's a really, it could be a really positive time, but it could also be a very dangerous time for some of these kids. Well said. Charles, what about you? What, then and now, what, uh, what big differences uh, that you see that uh, athletes, student athletes should be, be mindful of? I, I think the student athlete today is, is so much farther ahead coming into a university atmosphere than back in the 70s or when I came in. Um, we can compare it to social media today versus three major networks back then or no cell phones versus social media, or using a beeper. Anybody ever heard of a beeper? <laughs> you know, so we, it, things have changed so much technologically and it's changed socially from the standpoint of, I, I grew up with two parents, which I thought was fairly normal. Kids playing the sports today generally have a single mom taking care of them and, uh, I'm not against single moms. I think it's a great job, and they, most women do a great job. It's just one of those little ingredients that I was fortunate enough to have that I didn't notice that possibly made a difference. And uh, my parents raised nine boys and two girls on a 200-acre farm six miles from a town with 1,080 people. And... The people at the school, when school started, I was there when they integrated the school. When we came in the school, the first day of school, they go, who are these kids? Because we hadn't been in summer practice. We've been out working on the farm. So there was no telephone. We didn't have a phone growing up. You know, so I it- a party line? Uh, we, party we, line. we finally got a party, party line. line. Yeah. Yeah, you pick it up and say, can you? Yeah, yeah, we had to ask to use it. But- um, Today's kids, they don't speak our language. Uh, they have their own language. They got so many sources. They can ask Google, never talk to us at all. This thing started, I think, back in 78 when it came out with the Sony Walkman, and parents didn't know what their kids were listening to. I think that was the big divide right there. They could listen to any kind of music. They could dance like anybody else, and all of a sudden, the kids their age became their peer group and they raised each other, regardless of what we tried to impress upon them. Uh, I have a youngest brother, and I'll mention his name, Leonard, who went to UT. Now, Leonard makes me look like a runt. I mean, he's 6'7", 360, and he played for Arizona, the Cowboys, and so forth. I swear his frontal lobe still hadn't developed. <laughs> you know, he don't get what you, nothing. You know, he's got an ear for something else. So uh, today's kids are not a surprise to me, but it is uh, possible to get through to them. It's just you got to understand what it is that they are feeding off of and what they've been feeding off of. Um, they do a great job. They just do it the way they want to do it. 
So Kenny, I'll ask you this, and Charlie as well. The intersectionality of sports, a department like the School of Business, and social issues. How does an athlete use that, given the stage that they are given to perform and be accessible by the media, how does that intersectionality play in the favor of the athlete, and what would you be saying to a student athlete in the school of business around driving social change and issues that are in the public domain, how they should use their platform for the greater good? Yeah, I think you have to be smart, right, but also be authentic and intentional. I think when athletes or anyone in general is authentic and consistent, it, believe, it bleeds believability. Um, do you really care about this issue? Have you spoken about this issue before? Um, who is your audience? Who are you trying to talk to? What are you trying to influence? I think... Um, now, it, as athletes and students have, obviously, you have your phone and you can tweet and talk all day. But, like, what are you saying and what, are you, what needle are you trying to move? I think that's what really um, makes you an influencer, right? Are you actually influencing people? Or are you just trying to be a public figure? Are you trying to be famous? Or are you trying to move the needle? And I think people can tell the difference in that authenticity. Um, I found that being believable means you're being authentic to yourself. Um, are you putting your dollars behind what you're saying? Are you supporting these causes with your time and your money and other resources, or are you just tweeting about it? It's a big difference, right? So that's what I would encourage our athletes or anyone who wants to be, uh, you know, influence a, a social issue. You know, there's a, obviously risk to, to that. But know those risks going in. And, you know, one of my old bosses used to say, you got to be willing to lose. You got to be willing to lose what you have if you want to get what you care about. Um, and it was an election in this case. Like, what are you willing to lose over? Um, and that's the same sort of sense I get when it comes to these athletes. Are you willing to lose that contract? Are you willing to lose that sponsorship for something that you care about? Because that's what's on the line. You know, so um, I think it's about being authentic and asking yourself, you know, like, all right, I'm willing to lose over this issue that I care about. I'm willing to lose some cash. I'm willing to lose a rev some revenue. Um, because as we've seen, you will, um, for right or wrong, right? Like, but in, in, in today's uh, world where everything is super public all the time, um, what you say is going to be out there. And I think you and I are both proud of being trustees of uh, the way the business school, uh, Neely School, has in its curriculum business ethics uh, and communications and leadership accountability. Those are the things that you learn as students, not just being a student athlete, that you should pay attention to because when you step into an organization like a Pepsi, you are their representative. What you say is very important. Not only does it affect your personal brand, it also has a ramification of what you say in the public domain or on your little phone because you are not only Kenny Thompson, but you're also an executive with PepsiCo. Right. And uh, one can lose their job if uh, they don't keep all that perspective. Charlie, what about you? I mean, uh, social issues, the intersectionality of being a student athlete, the business school, your brand, and what people expect you to say and do and be a leader or say something about as it relates to public, uh, public issues? Well, public issues and being able to speak on them first requires a certain amount of education on those issues. Uh, I don't think just because you have a lot of money that makes you an influencer or anything special. Um, you have to educate yourself and check out each side of the issue. And maybe where you think you stand is not always uh, where you want to stand. Um, there's a side to each story, of course, and then there's probably something called the truth. The main thing, I think, for the social aspect of it and being able to navigate this whole thing is, number one, education. Number two, 
have the integrity to be fair and say what you really believe and not just play to the camera. What, what are the two or three things you would want to leave? Uh, just give us a, a description to just not only students, but to students, to athletes, and to faculty members of, of where we are in today's world and what should be things we should leverage from having a business school experience, whether it's you know, tangential or direct. Uh, what would three words you would use, Kenny, to you just so, kind of phrase I mean, out three what words? people should be cognizant of? <laughs> three words? That's a, that's a big question. Uh, you know, I think um, that's a, that's a, one of the things I think that I did, didn't do a great job of um, at TCU until probably the past 10 years, which sort of told you, tells you how old I am, was leveraging the university outside of Fort Worth. Um, I was just sort of like, oh, TCU, when I, I'll connect with TCU folks when I get back to Texas. But we're everywhere. That's, that's how I met you, right? Out, not in Texas. Um, I will say that my number one network, of all the networks I'm in, this is the most important one. This is the home base. And if you do it right, it will be home base for life. Um, I am fortunate enough to uh, sort of realize that over the past decade. I mean, I look at Josh Gardner's dad. Josh Gardner and I went to we played here together 25 years ago, 22 years ago. Um, you know, David Russell, just met him, you know, maybe three or four years ago. But it just keeps, it keeps going. And I think if you invest your time uh, and be intentional about building these relationships with your, your classmates, but also alumni, wherever you end up, it will be extremely beneficial to you. I was lucky enough to meet Ron Parker 12 years ago. Um, because I met him, I've, I am I'm on the board of trustees. I am you know, very involved in this university in a way that I wouldn't be had it not been for him. And there is someone like him for all of us if we put in the effort and the time. I want to be that for someone else. And I think that is probably the most important thing I've taken away outside of my amazing degree that's hanging up in my, my wall. Um, that is the most important thing that I've taken away from this university. Good. Thank you. Charlie. Right. First of all, TCU is, um, is, is, is such a part of who I am from the standpoint of everywhere I go, if I say TCU, somebody, oh, you went to TCU. Oh, so it's a big deal. And uh, we don't always think of it was a big deal when I came through as like survival, you know, <laughs> accountability. I mean, I was the first of the first of the first and just about everything I was doing, uh, trying to lay down some tracks for the future so some other kids can come through and maybe family. I had three brothers that attended TCU also, uh, a couple of nieces that came in as community scholars. So that was something that I'm very proud of. Uh, going to the NFL because I was drafted out of TCU was a fantastic opportunity. I, you know, Sunday, playing on Sunday, Pittsburgh Steelers making a run to the Super Bowl. You go down for a pregame meal, and Franco Harris has the sports page, and he says, let's see who played TCU this weekend. I said, let's see who TCU beat. They said, no, 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 no. He said, let's just see who played them. So, so it was a, an enjoyable thing to take TCU wherever I went. And um, I, it, it was just, I can't tell you how good it felt to have went to school here, and even to come back here today and can't find a place if it wasn't for GPS. <laughs> you know, where's the business building? And you, you know, no landmarks, they're all gone. They're covered up, they've got buildings sitting on them. Um, but for me, it's the accountability, self-accountability, just to be accountable and to be determined 
and make the commitment to focus and everything else will take care of itself. Very good. So how about a round of applause for <laughs> Kenny, Charlie Davis. Kind of like the, uh, the past, the present, and the future is how uh, uh, my three <laughs> words that I would use. David. Thank you. One more time. Can we give a round of applause for them? So I want to start by giving you a special congratulations. So you were the first student athlete to graduate from here. And when I graduated, you know, you, you laid the framework for people like myself. I remember thinking when we graduated, there's only six black people in my graduating class. And we all know each other. So I, I appreciate you filling that groundwork. Um, Trustee Thompson, Trustee Parker, thank you guys for hosting this conversation. We have some gifts. And can you grab those gifts? Uh, and while she's grabbing those gifts, I just want to give some parting words, because I took two things kind of away from this. One is be the change that you want to see. You guys had very different experiences, but you're still here contributing to the university in various ways to move us forward. So I want to encourage everyone who's sitting here has some connection to the university, continue to push things forward. Lastly, and most importantly, apparently Ron is the, uh, the path to trusteeship here for Kenny. So I'm hoping I can call that shit one day. Uh, Ron, I appreciate that. Thank you guys again for coming out. Go Frogs. <laughs>